Some shareholders of electric power utilities in Japan think the company should get out of the nuclear power business. However, their proposals were all rejected. Tokyo Electric Power Company and eight other utilities that operate nuclear plants held their annual shareholders meetings on Thursday. All the companies face shareholder proposals calling for decommissioning reactors or withdrawing from nuclear power generation. Shareholders of Kyushu Electric Power Company met as anti-nuclear campaigners protested nearby. The Nuclear Regulation Authority has confirmed that two reactors at the utility's Sendai plant meet regulations introduced after the 2011 Fukushima nuclear crisis. The firm plans to restart one of the facilities later this year. Kyushu Electric President Michiaki Uriyu said at the meeting that the, his firm aims to restart the reactor as soon as possible while ensuring safety as the utility's basic principle. Shareholder calls for withdrawing from nuclear power generation were also turned down at a meeting of Shikoku Electric Power Company and Kansai Electric Power Company. Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says he is determined to push through security bills during the current diet session. If enacted, the legislation would allow the country to exercise its right to collective self-defense under certain conditions. Abe spoke at the meeting of a lower house committee that is debating the bills. Opposition Democratic Party leader Katsuya Okada said the proposed legislation has neither the understanding nor the support of the public. There have been cases in which the public deepened their understanding of laws after they were enacted. We will make our own judgments when the legislature or its committees conclude that the issue has been thoroughly debated. Lawmakers from the ruling parties extended the current diet session until late September in a bit to make sure the bills go through. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for turning out in such large numbers for what promises to be a, a very interesting discussion. Uh, my name is David McNeil. I'm an ex-board member of this club and a freelance journalist. Uh, today's speaker is, of course, Natsuo Yamaguchi, the head of New Komito, or the chief representative, as he likes to describe himself. Uh, the uh, main point of interest, I suppose, for journalists, so one of the main points of interest is the uh, tension between New Komito, or Komito now, uh, and the LDP over uh, many issues, including nuclear power and the economy. Uh, but uh, it's on the issue of change to Japan's pacifist stance, uh, where the apparent differences between the two parties are strongest. Uh, the LDP is challenging the constitutional ban on collective defense, with potentially profound consequences for Asia. Uh, the, uh, its Buddhist-backed pacifist partner uh, is uneasy with many of the changes that the LDP is proposing. Its supporters call Komito a break uh, on the LDP's ambitions. Somehow, despite those tensions within the two ruling parties, uh, the, they have managed to work together now for uh, many years, uh, and despite rumors that they would break up, they have stayed together. Uh, Komito has shifted ground, or many people think it has shifted ground, on uh, self-defense policy without losing the support of its religious followers and a huge pool of voters, something like 8 million, who uh, put its politicians into power. Uh, our speaker, Yamaguchi Sensei, is uh, an ex-lawyer. Before he went into politics, uh, he's going to talk for about uh, 25 to 30 minutes, and then we'll take questions. Uh, can you give him the best of your attention, please, while he talks? Uh, and uh, may, if you have already done so, uh, apologize, but could you switch off your mobile phones? Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for your kind invitation today. I'm going to begin by uh, explaining some of my thoughts about uh, several topics that were given to me by the FCCJ. The first topic that was given to me today was uh, to speak about uh, security issues, uh, in particular the security legislation that is now being uh, deliberated in the Diet. I would like to explain to you um, our party's fundamental thoughts in regard to this legislation. 
Uh, as you know, Komeito has always taken uh, the tenets of the Constitution uh, very much to heart. It has pursued policies that support uh, the pacifism and the ideals of international cooperation that are expressed in the Constitution. It has also uh, uh, emphasized the need for uh, diplomatic um, efforts to try to uh, prevent uh, conflicts before they occur. Uh, it also has uh, expressed a desire to always support the uh, ideals of the Constitution, which is to contribute to uh, the international community. Having said this, however, I, I would like to be very, very clear. Uh, we do not believe uh, in the kind of um, peace pursuing policies, which are simply words, but we believe that uh, peaceful uh, intentions must be followed by actions. In other words, we want to create a peaceful situation uh, in a very steady and uh, 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 realistic way. In other words, uh, we pursue a, a peace uh, that uh, is uh, accompanied by action. I would like to um, emphasize several specific points. Uh, one is that uh, we believe uh, that uh, the heart of our se security uh, and peaceful uh, cooperation efforts lies in the uh, maintenance of the U.S.-Japan Security Pact. Uh, we also believe that we should play a positive role and uh, make uh, contributions to uh, increasing uh, the or deepening and strengthening the relationship between uh, countries uh, that are nearby to us, such as China and South Korea and other nations. Uh, the third area that we believe in very, very strongly as, uh, is that uh, as Japan is the only nation uh, that has been uh, the target or the recipient of a nuclear attack, uh, we believe very, very strongly in uh, trying to eliminate uh, nuclear weapons from uh, the earth. We believe that we should uh, not simply just wish this, but we should take a leadership position in trying to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, we also believe uh, that uh, there are uh, many other kinds of security uh, issues uh, that are very important for humanity. And we believe in people security. What I mean by this is that we believe that we should make contributions to eliminating poverty and uh, starvation and also the prevention of uh, the spread of uh, dangerous diseases. So it is based on uh, these four uh, principles uh, that I've just described that we have pursued policies that uh, uh, ensure that Japan becomes a more, ma a more peaceful nation. Uh, in particular, in regard to our relationship with China, uh, the Komito has long, mained, long uh, maintained a relationship with um, our counterparts uh, in uh, China. And as a basis of uh, continuous exchanges between uh, members of uh, our government and members of uh, their uh, government, we have been able to build a relationship of mutual trust. In other words, we have been able to pursue a policy, a unique policy of uh, maintaining constant dialogue. As you know, uh, at present in the Diet, uh, there is uh, um, considerable deliberation going on uh, about legislation that has to do with um, peace and uh, security and safety. Uh, and I believe that uh, in the years following the end of the Cold War, we have passed through s three historical stages which has led us uh, to this current um, situation. At um, every stage uh, during uh, this uh, past history, uh, the uh, Komito has always taken a very active, um, proactive role uh, in contributing to legislation that deals with the different issues of that time. Uh, in other words, whether we were a member of the uh, administrative uh, government or whether we were a member of the opposition parties, we have always deeply immersed ourselves in um, producing legislation uh, that falls within the framework of the existing constitution, but however uses uh, the um, abilities of the self-defense forces to create a more peaceful world. The first stage uh, following the uh, end of the Cold War uh, is a period that I would describe as being between 1990 and 1993. This was a period uh, when uh, the war saw the eruption of, um, or the beginning of the eruption of many, many uh, regional conflicts uh, that for many years had sort of stayed below the surface uh, because of uh, the Cold War uh, structure. Uh, as these regional conflicts began to appear, uh, the Komito uh, took a very proactive role in confirming uh, the fundamental tenets of the Constitution. Uh, what I mean by this is uh, that it is very, very clearly stated uh, in the Constitution, one of the great principles of the Constitution is that Japan will not take part in armed attacks, or in armed um, force, uh, the use of armed forces, and it will not uh, take uh, actions that are in concert with the armed attacks or armed um, forces or use of uh, forces uh, by other countries. 
uh, it was at this time uh, that Japan uh, was able to pass a law uh, that uh, directly translated would be the uh, law to cooperate with uh, peacekeeping, international peacekeeping uh, operations. Uh, as uh, this law was um, uh, formulated, uh, the Komito took a very strong uh, position ensuring that five fundamental important principles were included as part of this act or law. Uh, as a result of the passage of this law, uh, until now, until the present day, uh, the, the self-defense forces have taken part in 13 different activities, and uh, some 10,000 self-defense forces personnel have taken a, a part in these activities. At the time uh, that this law was being deliberated and finally passed, uh, there was a tremendous uh, and vocal movement within Japan. Uh, many people uh, objected uh, to the passage of this law. They were saying that it was against, uh, violated the constitution of Japan, and that it would uh, create a situation where Japan would eventually be caught up in armed conflicts and will eventually lead to uh, Japan participating in a war. Uh, in fact, the voices um, against uh, this uh, legislation was even strong, were even stronger than the voices that we are hearing today. However, over time, we have seen that this PKO law, PKO law uh, has been uh, widely accepted not only by the people of Japan, but also by the international community. The second stage, um, historically, uh, that uh, we, were, uh, we saw great changes in, uh, in terms of security legislation, was uh, at the beginning of the 21st century. This is when uh, there was legislation passed uh, to deal with um, contingencies. Hey. The reason uh, that uh, this uh, contingencies uh, legislation needed uh, to be realized or needed to be passed was because uh, among the countries in Japan's, uh, around Japan's uh, periphery, uh, there were countries or there was a country that was developing uh, ballistic missiles uh, with the intent, uh, it was assumed, uh, to target um, in part Japan. As a result, uh, there was a general understanding that the U.S.-Japan Security Pact would have to be strengthened in some way. In other words, the um, abilities or the functions uh, of the uh, Security Pact would have to be strengthened in some way, and that is why uh, this legislation was passed. At the time of the passage of this uh, contingency uh, legislation, a fundamental uh, decision or a fundamental um, understanding uh, was reached within uh, the limitations of the Constitution. Uh, there were many, many discussions about a constitutional uh, theory at that time. And the fundamental um, idea that was um, agreed upon was a principle that uh, if there was uh, some kind of an armed attack or there was an imminent armed attack uh, on uh, Japan's territory or Japan's territorial waters or on Japan ter or Japan's territorial air space, uh, then uh, Japan would have the right to defend itself um, using a military force. Uh, there was also one exception uh, to this uh, rule that was also um, accepted uh, at that time, which was that on the high seas, if there was an attack or an imminent attack uh, uh, that would eventually be directed against Japan, again, Japan would have the right to defend itself. And those in and at the same time, uh, there was a further uh, understanding uh, that was uh, in principle accepted, which was that uh, if uh, this attack or imminent attack uh, on uh, in, in areas uh, on the high seas of, uh, outside of uh, Japan's immediate territory were not against Japanese forces uh, directly, but against uh, other uh, nations' uh, military forces, uh, but with the intention that eventually that uh, armed attack or armed um, threat would eventually reach Japan, then Japan again also would have the right to defend itself. Of course, um, the threats uh, that were considered viable at that time were quite severe, which is why uh, there was so much deliberation and uh, this understanding, these basic principles were finally accepted. However, when we look at the current uh, security environment facing Japan, we see that it has become even harsher and more dangerous than before. The reason I say that uh, is uh, because uh, there have been an increasing number of terrorist attacks uh, which have involved uh, 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 Japanese uh, persons, so Japanese citizens. Uh, we have also seen the numbers of incursions into Japanese territorial airspace uh, requiring a Japanese um, uh, aircraft to scramble uh, to meet them. Uh, we have seen these uh, incursions uh, increase dramatically in number. Uh, we have also seen that some countries uh, in line with their growing economic might have uh, begun to increase their military presence presence in the world. So it is these environmental changes uh, and the need for Japan to be able to re uh, re uh, respond to these environmental changes uh, in the security situation that has led us to deliberate uh, this current uh, legislation. In other words, what we are aiming to develop is a seamless uh, 
overall framework or system uh, in which we will be able to prepare ourselves even during peacetime uh, so that we will be able to deal immediately with uh, contingencies if they might arise. Uh, it is only if, through having this kind of seamless um, security system that we will be able to protect uh, not only the peace and uh, safety of, uh, of Japan and its Japanese people, but also we will be able to make a significant contribution to the peace and stability of the international community. Uh, the uh, Japanese constitution, as uh, many of you are aware, uh, has very specific uh, restrictions on what Japan can and cannot do. So in regard to armed attacks that are directly um, uh, directed toward uh, Japan, in other words, if Japan is uh, basically defending itself or its own citizens, then uh, Japan does have the right uh, to use um, uh, military force to protect itself. However, the constitution also very clearly states uh, that uh, we cannot uh, use our uh, military strength to uh, protect other nations. Of course, uh, in regard to uh, the Constitution, uh, I would like to explain uh, how uh, the government uh, views uh, the uh, Constitution, in particular how the government uh, looks at Article 9. Article 9 uh, has um, uh, several um, uh, items or clauses under, uh, beneath it. The first uh, is that uh, Japan renounces uh, war, does not, uh, will not use military uh, force. And the second um, clause uh, basically says that Japan will never have um, uh, military forces for either ground forces or uh, maritime forces or air forces. So on the surface, uh, it looks as though Article 9 prevents Japan from uh, having any arms uh, at all. Uh, however, the preamble of the Constitution as, uh, explains that the Japanese people uh, and the Japanese nation have a right uh, to uh, continue to exist uh, in a peaceful way. Also, um, Article 13 uh, explains uh, that uh, the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, as long as it does not interfere with public welfare. Uh, in other words, uh, Japan uh, does have the right uh, to uh, engage in uh, armed uh, forces or armed conflict if uh, it is uh, in retaliation or in response to an attempt to uh, take away uh, the rights, the human rights of the Japanese people. Uh, in other words, in order to eliminate uh, such a threat or such a danger, uh, Japan does have the right uh, to uh, protect itself and therefore to maintain enough forces to be able to defend itself. At the same time, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Article 9 uh, explicitly states that uh, this uh, might or f uh, right to defend oneself, the power or abilities to defend oneself must be kept to a minimum. So in other words, we do have the ability, we do have the right uh, to defend ourselves, but uh, the ability uh, is must be kept to a minimum. Uh, I would also uh, like to mention that um, when we talk about uh, defense and the right to uh, self-defense, uh, there are two kinds of um, uh, self-defense rights uh, that are um, existing in international law. One is the uh, right to what we call individual self-defense, the right to defend one's own people in one's own country. And then there is a collective self-defense, which is not only the right to defend one's own country and one's own people, but also the uh, rights and the people and uh, the rights of other nations as well. Having said this, however, um, in Japan, it is very very clear, uh, we do have the right uh, to uh, ensure that we can protect ourselves from anyone or any country that tries to take away the Japanese people's human rights. Uh, however, uh, in regard to uh, the uh, right to protect uh, the rights of other nations, uh, people of other nations, and the right to protect other countries, although that is respected in international law, uh, according to our constitution, uh, we do not have that collective defense right. Having said this, however, uh, if uh, the attack on another country uh, acts or can be viewed as uh, the uh, beginning of an armed attack that will eventually uh, be directly affecting Japan, directly affecting the Japanese people in a very serious and important uh, way, in other words, uh, an attack that will eventually harm uh, in, in great, um, but in a great, on a great scale, the uh, Japanese people, then Japan would have uh, the right to uh, respond uh, in return. So in that sense, Japan uh, does have, again, in a very, very limited uh, sense, uh, the right uh, to uh, collect self, uh, collective self-defense as well. So I would like to explain, uh, in regard to uh, this uh, limited uh, uh, use of uh, collective self-defense, uh, it is uh, not that you look at a specific case and say that the uh, attack uh, was originally meant for just uh, for a Japanese um, person or a Japanese group or whether it was uh, directed toward another country, but whether that attack eventually uh, w in some way would harm uh, the uh, human rights of the Japanese people would have uh, some uh, 
uh, the effect of overturning the fundamental human rights uh, of uh, the Japanese people. If one can look at that situation in an objective manner and make that a decision, uh, then uh, the Japan does have the right in this very limited way to uh, use, exercise its right to collective self-defense. That has been the consistent uh, view of the Japanese government. I would like to uh, again emphasize uh, the fact that uh, what the kind of thinking that I've just explained to you has been um, very logically um, uh, thought out uh, over the years. Uh, it is the consistent um, long-term thinking of the government, and in the future, we do not expect uh, this thinking uh, to change. Uh, and, uh, and that is why we are proposing that uh, this be put in uh, the uh, current uh, legislation. In other words, uh, the fears that some people may have that uh, the uh, definition or of the concept of collective self-defense might be expanded eventually in, uh, in, in terms of the uh, concept uh, that is widely used in international law. In other words, collective self-defense uh, is widely understood as being the right uh, to defend um, other nations as well. This complete acceptance of the idea of uh, a, a wider scope of collective self-defense is not something uh, that Japan uh, can do uh, under its current constitution and, and under the current interpretation of the constitution. If a larger expanded um, understanding of uh, the idea of collective self-defense uh, is to be adopted by Japan, then we believe very strongly, and we have said very strongly, that the constitution would have to be amended. We have spent the past year uh, having uh, 25 uh, joint meetings uh, within, by the coalition parties, in other words, with our counterparts, uh, the LDP, on this matter. We have also had uh, 35 meetings uh, within the Komito on uh, this matter. We have discussed this matter thoroughly uh, from every possible point of view, uh, and we have taken uh, our uh, very deepened understanding of this issue uh, before uh, the people of Japan through the diet deliberations. It is our intention to keep on, continue explaining uh, this very complicated and difficult issue in a very clear and, uh, and uh, understandable way so that we can gain the people's understanding. Actually, I intended to talk about some of the other um, uh, themes that had been given to me by uh, the FCCJ, which was a constitutional uh, 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 revision and, uh, excuse me, and the tax system and uh, energy it, uh, policies. However, I am limited for some time, so I'd like to refer to these um, topics uh, during the question and answer session. Kind attention. Thank you, and uh, thank you for sticking to the 30 minutes to allow time for questions. We'll take questions from the working press first. Uh, I see Teddy's hand. Can I remind you uh, to state your name and the name of your organization when you approach, when you reach the microphone? Teddy first, and then um, Isabel. I'm Teddy Jimbo with the Video News. As a courtesy to the speaker, I'm going to ask questions in Japanese. So I'm, I'm Jimbo, uh, and I have two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, as you know, uh, the House of Representatives asked um, three constitutional experts uh, to come and speak before one of their uh, subcommittees about uh, and their opinions about uh, the security legislation being deliberated and uh, its constitutionality. And all three of them basically said uh, that uh, the current security legislation being deliberated was in violation of the Constitution. However, Mr. Komuro uh, the vice head of the uh, LDP said that finally uh, what uh, would be uh, these decisions would be based not on the um, uh, expertise of, um, of constitutional experts but rather by politicians. You yourself, however, are a lawyer. Do you have the same thinking as Mr. Komura? Uh, and just in general, what um, is your opinion of uh, the uh, views of these uh, three um, constitutional uh, academics? And secondly, uh, this idea that uh, the security legislation um, is necessary and special exceptions are made uh, in the case, uh, and the phrase that is being used uh, is that in the case where the very survival of Japan might be threatened. Um, even if uh, there is a case when uh, the forces of another country are attacked, Japan is not directly attacked, still it seems that uh, there might be possible cases where uh, the survival of Japan might actually be threatened, even if that attacking country has no intention of uh, attacking Japan. Um, although there have been many deliberations about this, many examples have been given by the government, people have been talking about uh, the cutoff of crude oil supplies or maybe food supplies, still it's very, very difficult for us to understand. What does Komito think might be an actual situation, if you would give one or two specific examples where an armed attack against another country might actually uh, threaten the survival of Japan. So in regard to your first question, um, I believe, of course, that uh, the opinions of the uh, constitutional experts uh, must be treated um, with uh, great respect, and we must humbly uh, 
take their um, 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 advice or their thoughts uh, as a, a reference point uh, for our deliberations. Having said this, however, as I mentioned in the Constitution, Article 13 says uh, that the fundamental uh, responsibility for protecting uh, the lives uh, of uh, the Japanese people lies with the government and with the diet. And as such, it is our responsibility uh, to determine uh, what the uh, f fundamental um, uh, functions of uh, the self-defense forces and the fundamental shape of our international cooperation should be. So it is with that understanding in mind that I've spent some time already describing to you uh, how the government views these issues and how the government views uh, the Constitution. So in regard to your second question, uh, this idea of uh, a threat uh, or a danger that would uh, threaten the very survival of Japan, uh, the most important point, uh, th there have been new uh, conditions uh, that have been uh, defined uh, as, uh, in this regard. But the most important point to keep in mind is that if there is a fundamental danger or fundamental threat uh, that uh, might fundamentally uh, uh, excuse me, threaten uh, to overturn uh, the uh, rights of the Japanese people to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If a specific uh, uh, incident occurs uh, that would cause a such um, uh, a danger uh, to be perceived, uh, then, then uh, we can respond to it. Um, this sounds ambiguous, however, it is not an ambiguous uh, threat. It, it's very, very specific. It says that um, if something happens and you can clearly see, it is objectively seen that uh, Japan uh, and its people uh, would have their uh, rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness threatened or overturned, and then we can respond. Uh, and I do not think it is necessarily all that helpful to give very, very specific examples about what might happen or what might not happen, but rather to uh, take an overall view of what is happening in the world and in the surrounding um, environment, and to be able to comprehensively uh, look at the potential dangers uh, so that we can prepare for them. Uh, that, I think, uh, is the most important thing to keep in mind. And the fundamental idea, again, is that even if an attack uh, is not uh, directly, at, uh, directly to, uh, directed toward Japan, if the result of that attack uh, on another force uh, has uh, the similar deep, uh, serious, and uh, disastrous, very large-scale um, effects on Japan, as almost as if uh, Japan itself were being uh, directly attacked, then that can be considered uh, a measure by which we can move. Isabel. Isabel Reynolds from Bloomberg. Um, you mentioned that one important aspect of Japan's security policy is relations with its neighboring countries. Um, now, we're, we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of Japan-Korea ties, and I understand there's some debate about whether the Prime Minister should attend a ceremony to mark that occasion at the South Korean Embassy. Would you like to see him attend, and what would you like him to say while he's there? Uh, as you've pointed out, uh, this, this uh, is a very, very important time uh, between uh, South Korea and Japan. Uh, this, uh, these ceremonies uh, that are being uh, planned, uh, not only in uh, Tokyo, but also in Seoul, uh, to commemorate uh, this very important uh, year, uh, is, um, are, are both uh, ceremonies that we should uh, watch with uh, great anticipation. I think it will be a very, very uh, opportune time for us to reconfirm on both sides uh, the importance of uh, the histories that we have shared over the past 50 years, and based Based on uh, confirming uh, the trust uh, that we have uh, with each other uh, and the good relations that we have each other to work to strengthen uh, those feelings of trust and um, good relations and so that we can move forward together in a positive way towards uh, the future. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there are uh, official ceremonies uh, being held um, in both uh, countries, in both cities. And if they are official ceremonies, of course, or official events, uh, it is only natural that invitations would be issued. And of course, uh, seeing how uh, the uh, reaction uh, to the uh, different invitations are, 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 are responded to, I think that uh, it is my great hope that uh, both ceremonies in both countries uh, end up being events uh, that are welcomed and considered successful by the people of both nations. Do you think that um, the Prime Minister should apologize for the war? Um, Prime Minister Abe has made it clear that uh, he has intended uh, to continue uh, in the footsteps of his predecessors, uh, predecessors uh, previous prime ministers and previous uh, cabinets uh, in regard uh, to uh, their views about uh, the war. In other words, he is uh, respecting uh, the uh, previous statements that have been made by uh, previous uh, ministers, prime ministers and uh, cabinets. Uh, and I believe that he is consistent uh, in his uh, be beliefs uh, and his statements. Uh, of course, there um, are uh, many uh, excuse me, um, 
it has been stated that uh, he might likely uh, issue some kind of a statement uh, to commemorate the 70th uh, anniversary of the ending of the war. But in regard to when he might issue such a statement and what the contents might be, uh, there has not been anything yet determined, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Having said this, however, until now, um, I have listened to uh, the statements that have been made by uh, Prime Minister Abe, and he has made it very, very clear that uh, in regard to the actions of Japan uh, before World War II, uh, there are, he feels, uh, deep remorse. In other words, uh, the, the Japanese words are fukaku hansei shiteru. And uh, it's on the basis of, of feeling this deep remorse uh, that Japan has been able to build uh, over the past 70 years um, a peaceful path uh, towards uh, a better future. And, and that is the path that he tends to follow uh, in the future as well. Uh, I think he has been very, very consistent in all of his statements until now. And to see with Reuters, I'd like to go back to the uh, question of the security legislation. You mentioned uh, that uh, one thing that was very important was to keep explaining uh, to the public uh, so that they would understand the need for the legislation. Uh, opinion polls consistently show that a vast majority of people say the explanation has not been sufficient, uh, that there's a division among voters who see it, it as necessary or unnecessary, but there seems to be a large, uh, fairly large majority that see no particular need to pass it in this session of parliament. Uh, parliament appears uh, to be going to be extended uh, at least until some point in August, but do you think it's absolutely necessary to pass this legislation in the current session of Parliament, or is it possible to uh, continue to explain it to the public to seek further um, understanding? As you know, uh, the Diant is still currently uh, in uh, its uh, session, and uh, as uh, the uh, member of the government and the ruling uh, parties, uh, we have uh, decided um, uh, in advance that we would do our very best uh, to ensure uh, the passage of this legislation uh, during this current session. Uh, we have uh, understood that this would be a very, very difficult uh, task. Uh, but because we have set this uh, task uh, f uh, before us uh, from the beginning, uh, we believe that we have the responsibility to see it through to the very end. Um, having said this, um, we understand and we have understood from the very beginning that uh, this is a legislation that is very, very uh, deep in nature in terms of contents and that the contents also are very, very um, wide ranging and therefore it is not something that you can immediately understand in just one hearing or just listening uh, or studying briefly about this. Uh, in other words, we knew from the very beginning that because it was such wide-ranging and complex and, and difficult legislation that we would have to s repeatedly explain to the public in a very, very uh, careful uh, and um, understandable way in order to gradually, over time, be able to get the, the understanding of uh, the people. And so we do, again, as I said earlier, intend to see it through to the end. We do wish uh, to un gain the understanding of the people and to pass it in this current session. I think Linda's point might have been the more that you explain, the less people seem to understand. Is that what you were kind of saying? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's me reading into your question. Sorry about that. Sí, no. Um, I believe what is necessary is that uh, we have an opportunity uh, to go back to the basics, explaining uh, this uh, legislation from the very, very uh, beginning. Uh, in other words, uh, recently I've been watching the media, and we, of course you've been watching uh, the diet deliberations, and it seems that uh, the discussions have focused on just certain aspects of this uh, very, very large piece of legislation. And uh, the specific small aspects that are being uh, focused upon are given much more coverage and much more attention uh, so that one cannot see the overall whole. I think it is um, important that we uh, take the opportunity and try to gain the understanding of the public by going back to the original intent be uh, behind our proposing uh, this legislation uh, to try to give an idea of the overall structure of the legislation and also explain very carefully to the public what what kind of safeguards or what kind of uh, checks are included uh, in the overall legislation to ensure that things do not go uh, too far. In other words, we have to continue to provide information in a very understandable way. Michael, uh, first, and uh, can I ask everybody, we're into the last 10 minutes, so can you keep your question short if possible? Thanks. Uh, Michael Penn of the Shingetsu News Agency. In March of 2003, uh, there was a threat which was uh, portrayed as a, an existential threat to the international community, which was the weapons of mass destruction possessed by the regime of Saddam Hussein. And on the basis of this existential threat, uh, the, the, much of the US and its allies, including Japan, uh, supported a, a, an attack on that country, even though it was not uh, supported by the United Nations. 
Uh, and in fact, I remember that the most critical uh, voice in Japan against France was that time uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary Shinzo Abe. My question to you is, if we don't understand what happened in the past, how can we protect ourselves in the future? The Japanese government, even until now, has never allowed an independent and full investigation of its own policy-making process in regard to the support of the Iraq War. Wouldn't it be a good opportunity to do that now, to make sure that in the future there isn't some threat that is portrayed as existential, which is not actually existential? At the time, uh, the Japanese, at the time, the thinking in Japan uh, was as that um, not whether or not uh, to support or not support the Iraq war, but rather Japan made the decision uh, based on a resolution passed by the United Nations to help uh, offer support in terms of the humanitarian and uh, reconstructive work uh, in uh, Iraq. As a member of the United Nations, uh, it felt that it had a responsibility to offer humanitarian and reconstruction uh, support. Uh, that is why the self-defense forces were sent to Samoa excuse me, a part of um, Iraq. Um, I would like to make it very clear, however, that uh, Japan uh, did not take part in any kind of armed conflict uh, in the war, and it did not provide logistical or rear uh, support uh, to uh, the armed forces there. Uh, so, uh, and in regard to uh, your suggestion that one looks back over past policies and try to learn from uh, past policies, certainly I do not uh, deny that uh, that is a very useful uh, um, uh, an activity. Uh, but at the same time, I, I would like to again repeat that Japan did not take part in armed attacks and it did not provide logistical support. It took part in what, have, what was sanctioned by the United Nations, the um, idea of providing humanitarian reconstruction um, support. And I would also like to add that um, the work of the self-defense forces uh, in that regard were highly regarded by the international community. Uh, and I would also like to explain that we have learned uh, from uh, the bitter lessons of the past. Uh, at the time of the Iraq War, uh, our activities uh, were sanctioned um, as a pa by the passage of a special measures law. However, um, special measures laws um, are, are things that you have to deliberate each and every time. And so in order to uh, counter some of the difficulties of handling special measures laws or passing special measures laws, we've decided to uh, improve on this um, process by passing a permanent law uh, this time. And having, however, um, proposed this um, permanent uh, legislation, we have ensured that there are three prerequisites uh, for being able to provide a logistical support. One is that it must be an action that is condoned by the international community, in other words, uh, by the Un United Nations. And secondly, that we must have prior approval of uh, the uh, Japanese diet. And thirdly, that the uh, security uh, or the safety of the self-defense for personnel, uh, self-defense forces personnel must uh, be uh, secured uh, on the responsibility of the Minister of Defense. And specifically, what I mean by that is that uh, the self-defense forces personnel will only be sent to areas where um, it is uh, not predicted that uh, any armed conflict will arise. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I, um, I am tempted to take uh, one more question, but we have been told to wind up at exactly um, <clears throat> at exactly four o'clock. So with apologies to people who still have their hands up, uh, we'll wind up there. Uh, can you uh, please show your appreciation to uh, Mr. Yamaguchi for coming and explaining his policies and being so forthright, and also to the wonderful Takamatsu-san who uh, had to explain all that in English. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, can I just remind you, first of all, that two of the three scholars who uh, disagreed with the interpretation, the government's interpretation of the Constitution, will talk here on Monday, is that right, chung -san? Monday, uh, next Monday, that is. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, a bun fight, come along to that. Uh, and uh, can I also remind you, please, to stay seated until uh, Mr. Yamaguchi leaves the room. Thank you.